In this video, we address two topics. First, pseudepigraphy, and second, First Timothy with respect to pseudepigraphy. So we're gonna talk about pseudepigraphy, what it is, and then we're gonna move over to First Timothy and do some work on the historical and cultural context of First Timothy and talk about why some scholars think that Paul did not in fact write 1 Timothy, though it's attributed to him. So uh, by the end of this video and the end of this week's unit, you should be able to articulate what pseudepigraphy is in your own words. And you should also be able to say why some scholars think that 1 Timothy is pseudepigraphical. So with respect to our course thesis, we're dealing with the historical, cultural, and religious context of the New Testament text. Uh, so we're dealing specifically with 1 Timothy, but we're also dealing with the historical and cultural context of pseudepigraphy, that the way that we think of the term pseudepigraphy is different from what ancient people would have thought about this context. And to sort of get us moving in this direction, to sort of get your wheels turning on the topic of pseudepigraphy, I want to start out with our lecture pause. So what I want you to do here is when you pause the video is to write on the term pseudepigraphy. Explain what it is or predict what it is. So you may have some familiarity with this concept already either coming into the class or maybe you've already done some of the reading for the week that addresses it. Whether or not that's the case, I want you to sort of in your own words think about in writing pseudepigraphy, what it is, and then moving to uh, sort of a theological take on the concept of pseudepigraphy as it is applied to the New Testament in particular. So whether or not you think it might be a problem theologically or otherwise, if some New Testament uh, texts are in fact pseudepigraphical. So now that you've done that, I'm going to sort of lay out my take on pseudepigraphy and give us a little bit more information about what pseudepigraphy is and what we're talking about when we use this term or concept. And I want to do this by starting with these two Rembrandts. One is a pseudo Rembrandt and one is a real Rembrandt. Can you tell which one is the actual Rembrandt? If you're anything like me, you would probably assume the one on the left. That's actually, when I look at these two images, I look at the one on the left and I, for some reason, that image draws me in more than the, the, the one on the right does. I think it might have to do something with the brightness. Um, but the one on the right is actually what art historians say is the real Rembrandt. And the one on the left is the fake Rembrandt. And I show you these um, because with these particular images, uh, we have two pieces wherein one is imitating the other, but in a way that is meant to dupe the viewer into thinking that the false Rembrandt or the pseudo Rembrandt is actually painted by that artist. And that is not quite what we have with respect to pseudepigraphy in the New Testament. That I want you to, uh, before we even move to defining pseudepigraphy, I, I want to be clear that I don't want you thinking about pseudepigraphy as necessarily a bad word, as uh, meaning something false or meaning that the author is trying to dupe the audience into thinking that someone wrote the text that did not actually write the text. And so uh, we'll sort of explain why that's the case as we move forward in this concept of pseudepigraphy. Uh, so when we're talking about pseudepigraphy, etymologically, what the different uh, parts of the word mean. They come from two, uh, two different Greek words uh, that, are, that are put together, uh, meaning pseude meaning false, and then epigraphy meaning an ascription. So a pseudepigraphy is a false ascription. That is to say, the ascription of who wrote the text is not necessarily the person that actually wrote the text. It is not a false writing, um, or it's not, uh, it's not to say that the, the writing itself is false. It has specifically to do with the ascription of who wrote it. So when we're talking about pseudepigraphy, we're talking about texts that are ascribed to a person that might not have actually been written by them, but this does not make them uh, necessarily illegitimate. That we have uh, texts that can be written or ascribed to a person uh, in a way that is not uh, intended to 
to trick someone or to dupe someone to thinking that they are actually written by that person. So we have an example of this from our reading for this week with uh, Dr. Martin Luther King's uh, Paul's letter to the American churches, that we know that uh, Paul is not actually writing this letter, even though Dr. King ascribes it to Paul. Um, so moving to the reasons that scholars are going to claim that certain Pauline texts are pseudepigraphical. They aren't uh, written by Paul, and 1 Timothy is going to be included in this category here, is usually because they have a different style linguistically and sort of textually. They read a lot differently than do, uh, than, than do other Pauline letters, and we'll look at the specifics of this with respect to 1 Timothy in a little bit here. Uh, there's sometimes historical analysis anachronisms where what is said in the letter is sort of out of place with what we would expect to be said if the letter was written during Paul's lifetime. Um, and then also theological inconsistencies, that there's differences uh, between what we would call the disputed letters of Paul and the undisputed letters of Paul as to what Paul sort of puts out there, what the author puts out there theologically or ideologically. And then lastly, we sometimes have biographical discrepancies from what we find in the book of Acts. So if, uh, if for example, something in the pastorals uh, doesn't quite match up but with what we find in Acts, scholars find that a reason to maybe doubt that, uh, that Paul actually wrote the, the text in question. So when we're talking about Pauline texts, here we have, again, our undisputed letters and our disputed letters. When we're talking about the undisputed letters, we're talking about those seven letters that all New Testament scholars are going to agree were written by Paul. These are going to be Romans, Galatians, Philippians, Philemon, 1 Thessalonians, and 1 and 2 Corinthians. The disputed letters are the six letters uh, of Ephesians, Colossians, 2 Thessalonians, and then the pastorals. So all of the pastorals are included in the disputed category. And uh, it's not as though, and I've said this before, it's not as though that, uh, that scholars are either in one camp or the other, that they accept the undisputed letters, uh, the undisputed letters and don't expect uh, accept any of the disputed letters as authentically Pauline. Um, you do have some scholars that will only say, you know, these seven letters are written by Paul and these six letters were not written by Paul. But you also have many scholars who will uh, accept some of the disputed letters as actually written by Paul. And then you'll have some scholars who also will accept all of the disputed letters as, as written by Paul. So there's a sort of spectrum in New Testament scholarship um, wherein one scholar might think only seven letters are written by Paul, another might think all 13 are written by Paul, another might think 8, 9, 10, 11, or 12 are written by Paul. And so I mentioned earlier that false ascription is uh, the term pseudepigraphy means false ascription. And it's, so it's not meant to be a, a sort of a negative stamp on a letter saying that this is a false text or it's not, uh, it's not meant to be a bad word that rules out um, a given letter as not authoritative or as uh, or as illegitimate. And part of the reason for this is because we there's sort of a spectrum of pseudepigraphy in antiquity and even today that a that a text that is ascribed to a person that did not write it uh, uh, might be might be falsely ascribed for a variety of different reasons. Um, and so the, some of these different reasons or some of the different, we might call these different categories of pseudepigraphy, uh, we should, should think of them sort of on a spectrum here. So on one end of the spectrum, uh, I have put literal authorship over here on the left. And then on the right, I have forgery. And oftentimes this is the way that we sort of come to thinking about pseudepigraphy when we first come to it. We either think, well, it's literally written by Paul or it's not literally written by Paul. So it's either uh, it's either authentic, it's good, it's inspired. And if it's not, then it's, it's a forgery, it's bad, it's meant to, uh, it, it, this has been done with some sort of ill intent. And that's not the way that uh, New Testament scholars nor persons in the ancient world would think about pseudepigraphy. 
but rather authorship and pseudepigraphy exist on this spectrum wherein you have these different categories. So moving over from literal authorship to forgery, we're gonna have different ways that a figure might be involved in the actual creation of a text. So we have literal authorship where, you know, under this uh, concept, Paul is taking pen in hand and writing pen on paper. Uh, the next step over, we have dictation, which we do know that Paul utilized, where he is telling someone what to write and they write it up. And remember, we even have talked about how di there's a spectrum of dictation that an author can have more or less control um, with dictation. The next category over, we have delegated authorship, where Paul might have said, hey, I want uh, I want you, Tertius, to write up this text uh, about XYZ. I try trust you to write it in a way that uh, reflects my ideas that I've told you about. And then as we move further to the right, we get posthumous authorship, a text that may have been started by Paul or may have been uh, wholly written by Paul and then sort of later published, later put out there or finished by another figure and then sent out. We also have the idea of apprenticeship authorship. This is where a student of a, of a key figure like Paul, sort of under Paul's tutelage, might have written a text uh, either under the author's instruction, under Paul's instruction, or in Paul's honor. And this is moving us over to honorable pseudepigraphy, where a sort of student or follower of Paul or a, a student or follower uh, member of sort of the early Jesus movement wanted to honor Paul and so uh, ascribed a text to Paul's name even though it's not actually written by Paul. And usually in these kinds of cases, uh, the audience is going to know, it's going to be obvious to them that the letter is not in fact written by Paul because, you know, for example, the audience knows that Paul has died, that Paul is not living. So this is the case with Martin Luther King Jr.'s uh, letter that we're reading for this week, is that we know, of course, and when Martin Luther, Dr. King wrote this letter um, in the 60s, uh, everyone knew that this was not actually from Paul, but it's from Dr. Martin Luther King, but it's written in Paul's name in sort of an honorable way. And then on the, the far right, we have the forgery, where, and we have the example of the Rembrandt and the pseudo Rembrandt, where the text is actually meant to, uh, it's using a figure's name to, uh, in a way that is, is meant to sort of prop up the, the writer's ideas or the writer's, um, the writer, what the writer is trying to do by, by ascribing a, an important figure to the text, it gives the text more weight in a way uh, that is actually somewhat dishonorable. And I, I'm, I will be clear that we do have this kind of thing in uh, pseudepigraphy in antiquity and pseudepigraphy today where there is ill intent, but most persons who take uh, a letter like 1 Timothy not to be written by Paul wouldn't say that, it is, that it's a forgery, but rather it's probably something like honorable pseudepigraphy or apprenticeship authorship. And so speaking of 1 Timothy, I want to address why some scholars think that a text like 1 Timothy uh, or a text like 2 Timothy and Titus do not, are not actually written by Paul himself. So many of the things that are said about 1 Timothy, similar kinds of arguments are made for the other pastoral epistles, namely 2 Timothy and Titus. So we're dealing with a disputed Pauline letter that uh, the the doubt about whether it was actually written by Paul himself comes from stylistic features from a sort of developed church structure that we find in the letter, uh, an emphasis on false teaching that looks a little bit different than uh, false teaching as Paul addresses it in a letter like Galatians, and then also some uh, different theological and social themes. So what we're going to do is look at uh, some of the specifics of these arguments. So with respect to style, we find that there's this sort of unusual vocabulary in the pastoral epistles that's not found in other Pauline letters, whether that be the undisputed letters or the other disputed letters like Colossians or 2 Thessalonians. And there's these certain phrases and specifically an emphasis on sort of right teaching or sound teaching, sound speech, sincere faith, or uh, this phrase, the saying is sure. So we have this emphasis uh, and repeated, uh, repeated phrases 
uh, expressing right teaching. But then we also have all of these words that are not in the undisputed letters that do appear in 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus. So uh, over 300 words that are not in those seven undisputed letters, but are in 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus. And then we also have, uh, so not only do we have additional words in the pastorals that we don't find in the undisputed letters, but we have missing words in the pastorals that are seem to be really important themes in Paul's other letters, these sort of characteristically Pauline phrases or ideas like uh, the Spirit or the Holy Spirit. Um, the phrase in Christ never occurs in 1 Timothy. Uh, the word justify, which uh, is used very often, 25 times in the undisputed le letters, and justification, which occurs 50 times in the undisputed letters, uh, occurs only three times in 1 Timothy. And then also sort of the way that Paul uh logically thinks or logically writes using conjunctions. Paul likes to sort of have his uh, his language build upon itself logically using words like therefore, since, uh, but now, or with the result that. We don't find these quite as often in the pastoral epistles as we do in the undisputed letters. And then the also uh, the general style. There's a sort of argument from general style that that there's some general features of the pastorals um, and specifically 1 Timothy that differ from the undisputed letter. So that 1 Timothy is addressed to an individual. So even with the letter like Philemon, uh, which is sort of addressed to an individual, but it's also addressed to other individuals and the church that meets in Philemon's house. So that the pastorals are 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 different from uh, from these other letters insofar as they are addressed to one person particularly. We don't have a Thanksgiving in 1 Timothy. Of course, we also don't have a Thanksgiving in Galatians. Uh, but as we've seen with Galatians, there is a particular reason that that was the case. And then uh, 1 Timothy is going to be sort of more philosophically styled, that there's going to be more of this philosophical language. And there's there's this way in which that Paul is, or the letter of, of the writer of 1 Timothy is sort of uh, promoting a perspective a certain uh, philosophy or ideology in a way that is not the same as what he's doing in the undisputed letters. And then also along with this uh, this fact that there are certain conjunctions missing, missing uh, the, the sort of arguments of 1 Timothy are not quite as involved. They don't sort of go down the rabbit trails um, that we see in Paul's other undisputed letters, that Paul is sort of this inveterate rambler in his other letters. Well, he'll have an idea and then he'll come to another idea and sort of explain that out and that'll make him think of another idea and then sometimes he'll circle back to his original idea. We don't have Paul following those rabbit trails so much in 1 Timothy as we do in a letter like Romans or Galatians. And then we also have this argument from church structure. The fact that in 1 Timothy, it appears that there has been a time that has passed and there is a developed church structure for uh, it within early Christianity. So that you have... Uh, a mention of what appears to be official positions within early Christianity addressed in the pastoral epistles and specifically within 1 Timothy. Uh, we have terms like bishops, elders, deacons, and widows um, that are appearing in the letters, but they also seem to be official categories, that they've sort of uh, congealed into something that is a recognized category within the early church. And the thought is then that, um, that these categories or these ideas uh, demonstrate that time has passed. Enough time has passed that uh, that there's been some development of structure within early Christianity that there wouldn't have been within uh, Paul's context when things were a little bit more um, ad hoc, as it were. That Paul is just dealing with issues as they come up uh, because there aren't official positions in this new budding Jesus movement as there are when uh, when the author of First Timothy writes, and the same thing, the same sort of logic is at work with this phrase, the laying on of hands in First Timothy four. That this appears to be a practice that has developed, a regular practice that over time has been regularly utilized. Uh, and the thought is then that you know this wouldn't, this wasn't developed in the undisputed letters, but happened later on. So. For those who uh, understand 
the pastorals to be not written by Paul, the argument is then that, well, that amount of time suggests that this is much later on. These letters were written uh, after Paul has passed away. For those who accept the pastorals as written by Paul, the argument is then that Paul wrote these later after these things had developed, that there's nothing to say that Paul uh, could not have written these letters later on, um, but then the uh, those who accept the letters have to uh, think that these are later Pauline letters, that these are written after uh, a text like Romans, uh, sort of in Paul's second missionary career, as it's often called. And then on to our different social and theological themes between uh, the pastorals and the undisputed letters. We have false teachers, yeah, a sort of idea or theology of women in ministry, and a theology of slavery. Uh, so what I want to do here is I'm not going to read through all of these. What I encourage you to do is pause each one and uh, before I explain what the differences are here, I want you to look at what is on the left with 1 Timothy or uh, in some of these other cases, I think we're going to have some other uh, um, pastoral epistles and compare it with what you find on the right and see if you on your own can sort of articulate what the different perspectives being put forth here are. So go ahead and pause, look at these three texts from 1 Timothy, the two texts from Galatians, and see if in your mind, you don't need to write anything down, just note what the differences are between false teachers in these two different texts. So what I see when I look at these two different texts is that in the pastoral epistles, what first jumps out to me is that we have named individuals, that it's uh, very clear who it is that um, is is promoting a certain false teaching. That is not the case in, in Galatians or the other Pauline letters where we, we don't really have Paul naming specific individuals, calling them out as, uh, as it were. And then also the sort of nature of the false teaching is different between Galatians and 1 Timothy. Timothy. Whereas in Galatians, it's very clear that the issue is circumcision, but Paul is not quite as direct about naming the issue um, and 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 sort of prescribing it as this is what's wrong, this was this is what needs to change. Uh, and even though we know it's circumcision, that's different from what we find in First Timothy. That we have things like uh, myths and en endless uh, genealogies, the forbidding of marriage, the abstinence from food in First Timothy. So these are all different issues that. Uh, the false teachers are promoting in 1 Timothy than they are in Galatians. So let's go ahead and do the same thing here uh, briefly with women in ministry, looking at 1 Timothy's take uh, on women in ministry, and then uh, a text from Romans, Philippians, and 1 Corinthians, all undisputed Pauline letters, and see if you can identify what the difference is here. So in the case of the first two undisputed selections here, we have uh, what appears to be women who are very important to Paul's ministry and are holding leadership roles. In contrast to in 1 Timothy uh, 2, an explicit teaching from this author saying that women may not teach or have authority. So there seems to be a contradiction here uh, between what we find in Romans and Philippians and what we find in 1 Timothy 2. And then this 1 Corinthians passage isn't necessarily sort of a, a direct statement of Paul's um, on uh, women uh, in ministry or women and ministry, um, but it is Paul's uh, take on uh, on women and men in a certain way. And I wanted to make sure I included that um, because it does come from an uh, from an undisputed letter. And then lastly, let's go ahead and look at uh, slavery in 1 Timothy and slavery in two other texts that we have looked at this semester. So let's uh, go ahead again and pause, read through these texts and identify what the differences or similarities are between the two texts or three texts, I should say. So, of course, on the left-hand side with 1 Timothy, we have an explicit statement that slaves should obey and be respectful to their masters. And then on the right-hand side, we have Galatians 3, uh, 3.28, Paul's famous statement that there's neither Jew nor Greek, slave or free, male or female, that in Christ Jesus, there all of these different uh, binaries have been uh, have been broken down. And then, of course, we have uh, Philemon, the issue of whether Onesibus uh, should be freed or whether he should be accepted back by Philemon, uh, especially if you take the stance that Paul is urging um, Onesimus' freedom, then this is, of course, going to be sort of in contradiction 
um, not necessarily a direct contradiction, but it's going to be a different take than what we find in 1 Timothy 6, where uh, where the author of 1 Timothy, uh, whether it be Paul or someone else, sort of understands slavery to, to remain in place, and slaves should, on the basis of their Christian faith, act in a certain way towards their masters. And so what we have with all three of those um, sort of different issues is that especially for those of us who would like to think of the Bible as sort of, more, as sort of liberative um, and uh, socially progressive in a way, these uh, aspects of the pastorals might be problematic for us. Or they might be difficult. And so uh, I don't necessarily have the answer of what we do with a difficult passage in the pastorals or anywhere else in the Bible for that matter. But what I want to do in this last slide here is just give us some sort of options for what one might do. And uh, really, uh, this comes down to the individual Christian, the way that they think about Scripture, the way that they apply and interpret and read Scripture um, uh, to, to figure out sort of how to wrestle with and think through what are difficult passages. I mean, particularly difficult when we place them side by side with passages that seem to be a bit more liberative. So these are different ways that um, Christians sort of throughout the ages have dealt with difficult passages in the pastorals or elsewhere in the Bible. So one uh, one option is just straight up to deny them. And you'll find this sort of uh, the further left you go on the ideological and theological uh, spectrum that uh, for some for some people, uh, for some Christians, and certainly for people that don't hold the Bible as authoritative, you can just just call these passages out as uh, as sort of non-binding. That uh, maybe because they're not written by Paul um, under uh, under this un under certain pseudepigraphy uh, theories, that they just they don't apply the same way that the seven undisputed letters do. So one option is to just kind of uh, take them and and not use them for the life of the Christian. Another is to ignore them or belittle them. Just uh, kind of. Uh, Think about them as not there, as uh, as 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 not to to not wrestle with them, uh, or to say that because they're not Pauline, that they are not as binding as those that are uh, truly Pauline. Another uh, another uh, option that has been taken is to accept them wholesale. Of course, for slave owners, First Timothy six was uh, a text that they celebrated and they would use to keep people enslaved uh, in in my a very problematic thing to do, but people have accepted these uh, difficult texts wholesale and tried to just sort of blanketly apply them um, in a way that benefits in uh, that particular person. Uh, another uh, thing to do is to affirm them as inspired scripture. And I should stop right now and say that these aren't uh, these different options aren't sort of mutually exclusive. Um, so one can sort of accept and recognize that uh, that if one holds the entire canon of the New Testament to be inspired scripture, um, then one has to you know figure out what to do with the difficult passages. And it might be one of the options above, or it might be uh, something like struggling with them and uh, and holding them as inspired, but at the same time as, as difficult in application and uh, problematic in application in many cases. And then another thing to do, and I think uh, we should always attempt to do this, and after doing so, we may still come to one of the above conclusions, is to sort of contextualize them, is to think about the specific circumstances, historical and cultural, uh, of the first century world generally, but also of the specific letter that we are addressing. That if we look at uh, something like 1 Timothy and try to figure out what might be going on, uh, it, and why a, a figure might say something like slaves should obey their masters, what is it contextually, what is it about the historical or cultural context of First Timothy that might make this actually, um, might make this make more sense um, in the context of the first century world or in the specific context in which the letters were written. So I always encourage us sort of to uh, at least, for, so for those of us uh, 
and those of us in a seminary who hold the New Testament to be an inspired text, I encourage us to always struggle with difficult texts. Do not sort of shy away from them, not ignore them, uh, and try to think about them contextually and not to accept them wholesale and certainly not to accept their problematic applications. We should uh, we should deny those and we should, as Christians, be sort of the first ones to call out uh, bad applications and bad interpretations of difficult passages um, so that we are sort of engaged in this task, the difficult task of dealing with those things that are hard for us to deal with.